Um, we're going to have two different scripture readings this morning, and I'd encourage you to read with us if you, if you can. Our first one will be found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Pro- book of Proverbs, chapter 31. And we'll begin reading in the 10th verse and read down to the end of the chapter. And then we'll turn to Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll read there as well. So I'll give you just a moment to find both of those passages, Proverbs chapter 31 and Ephesians chapter 5. Last week we um, preached about husbands and how they're meant to be a picture of Christ in the home. And this week we're going to look at the flip side of that coin and consider wives. And so I ask you to pray for me this morning as we try to look to the word of the Lord for wisdom and guidance today. Proverbs chapter 31, beginning in verse 10, begins with a question. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hands to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up, and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And we'll read one more scripture reading and this is a similar one that we made last week. We're not going to read quite as long today. Ephesians chapter 5 and we'll look at verse 21. It says this, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And that will conclude our second reading this morning. That's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 28. And the title of our message today is similar to last week. Um, It's Wives, a Portrait of the Church. Wives, a Portrait of the Church. Now I'd like to emphasize again this morning, like we did last week, that 
the world and Christendom, however you define that, or at least the religious world in America today, I believe have both distorted the biblical principles regarding, the regulations regarding, and the design that God had in mind with husbands and wives. And so we must beware to step away from the, as we mentioned last week, the distortions from one side of the political spectrum and perhaps the overreaction and the attraction of pragmatism and things just all being for our practical benefit, that if we just order things the way God designs it, it works, which is what one side of the political spectrum will say. They'll advocate to some degree roles, but it's merely for our benefit. It's for how it affects us. But when we step into the biblical narrative, we find that God in all things is a meticulous designer. He is not confined in his creation to doing things for one singular purpose. But rather, God in his meticulous design is able to make things a beautiful picture, is able to display the gospel of Christ while simultaneously designing a system which is advantageous to all of us. And so this design that we spoke of last week, we charged husbands and fathers that your responsibility that God has given you is to look to your homes and to be the servant leaders of your homes, that you are meant to be emblematic of, a picture of and a representative of Jesus Christ in your home. And that is an impossible standard to meet, and yet one we're to strive for diligently. In the same sense, God has given us in Proverbs 31 the opposite to that, which is a type or an example that women will not be able to live up to. Many times, Young married women can feel crushed by the weight of Proverbs 31 because they look down through this description and it is a lofty description. And you might have looked down through there and went, ooh, I'm not very good at that or I don't do that. And so we want to balance the reality that the Bible lays forth for us as husbands, as men, as wives, as women, as children, perfect examples And we ought to strive to reach those perfect examples. And when we fall short or see certain deficits in our character or in our fulfillment of what God's calling is, let's not let Satan use those to bludgeon us and stress us and overwhelm us to the point that we might just say, you know what, I'm done with this. It's too much weight to carry. But rather, let us humble ourselves under the eyes of God asking and beseeching him, Lord, I want to be like this because your design is perfect and I want to be a reflection of the man or the woman that you have designed and called me to be. And when we see deficits in our character, let us go humbly to the cross of Christ, asking him for a strength to go beyond ourselves to help those that God has called us to. Here, We find in this text, and I might back up today for just a few moments. We talked last week and we talked about how male headship is important. That being a leader of your home and in that channeling a servant's heart to your home, but also the the fortitude and the willingness to make decisions that oftentimes can be difficult and hard to love with an intensity the people in your home Men are called to do that. And here we find in the text that uh, there are three reasons, or I want to give at least three reasons before we look specifically at Proverbs 31 today as to perhaps why God, or what it shows us in the Scriptures, why God set it up this way. If we were to turn, and I'm not going to read it here today, but if we were to turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2, we would see that God articulates A couple reasons there as to why God made man the head of the home and the woman his helper. 
1 Timothy chapter 2. He doesn't hearken, and this is what I would pause and say this morning. Oftentimes, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 3, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you go to Ephesians chapter 5, and we learn of this design that God had for husbands and wives, one thing that people tend to do, especially within Christianity in America today, is they try to trivialize those things by explaining them away. So one explanation that you'll commonly hear today is that was the culture of the time. That they lived in a pagan Middle Eastern culture and it was more natural for women to be, I'll even use the word subservient to men, much like the Middle East is today. Some cultures at that time, women were actually legally the property of men. And so oftentimes what people will do is they'll look to the scriptures and they'll say, Paul and Peter, while they're writing this, they're just tailoring their message to the culture. And yet when we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, we don't find that Paul's proof for this is the culture. Rather, what he cites is creation. He goes back to Genesis chapter 3 and begins to cite God's design. And the first thing that he brings to our attention in 1 Timothy chapter 2 is that first, God created man. And one reason why the wife is meant to be the helper or the aid, or as used in the King James, the help meet for man, which means suitable for or a companion of man, is because man was created first. Paul cites that and he Further, if we look in the book of Genesis chapter 3, you all know the story when God created Adam and then after Adam, he took Eve from man's rib. So God created man first and then woman was made to be some sort of a offspring from man. She was created literally from man. And it says there that she was bone of his bone. She was part of him. She came from him. One reason she's to be his helper. Helper in what? Helper in what? Right, we don't just think, let's not just think in purely, again, our lives here. But really this establishment of God's design from the Garden of Eden is that Adam's calling was to worship and enjoy God forever. And yet, in his loneliness, he was unable to satisfactorily do that. God sees this, and he says, let me create woman for you, that you two together can complement one another and fulfill the purpose and design that I have for you, and that is to glorify and enjoy me forever. Did you know part of God's enjoyment is the, able, the ability to have a spouse and a family? When I am loving my wife and my children and finding satisfaction in them and crediting God for those things and enjoying them, that can be a form of worship to God. One of the reasons why the design is the way it is is because he cites creation. A second reason, we go back to the Garden of Eden, we learn that God, after man's sin, cursed every person or entity involved in that. Right? We remember the blame game that they played. God confronts Adam because he gave Adam the law. After the law was given, then he created Eve. And so Adam was made responsible for not eating or touching of that tree, personally responsible by God. Adam defied God, and as the Bible teaches, was tempted by his wife and partook of that. It's the second reason he cites in 1 Timothy chapter 2, it was because Eve enticed Adam is one of the reasons why man was made the head of his home. But if you'll notice there in the curses, it tells us something extremely important. So God curses the serpent first, and he says there will be enmity between thy seed and her seed, speaking of Christ. That's the first, if you go to First Genesis, or excuse me, if you go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it's the first prophecy of the Messiah that the woman would have a seed. I'm not going to get into all that morning, but women don't have seeds. Men have seeds. And yet what we know of the Virgin Mary was that she was one 
that the Holy Spirit overshadowed, and that's how Jesus is of the woman's seed. We won't get into that morning, but Satan was cursed. Then it goes to the next person involved, which was the woman. And it tells us that she's going to experience two curses for her sin. Many of the women in this room could testify loudly to the first one. And maybe at the time you did testify loudly to the first one. Pain and childbearing. That there would be pain in that action. And then it tells us something else in Genesis chapter 3. A second curse. And that is this. That her desire, as the King James puts it, would be for her husband. Now, that scripture has always eluded me the understanding of it because especially in our culture today, if you read it how some people have rendered it, which could be the meaning, I'll I'll leave it open. And and if you have a better understanding of that text than I do, I certainly am open to to better understanding that. But is that women in one sense would be highly dependent upon men. That it almost makes it out in that text, some people would interpret it, as if they pine away for the help and assistance of their husbands. It doesn't seem to me like it has that natural rendering. If you go to Genesis chapter 4, I believe we get a better insight into what that text means because it tells us something about Cain and Abel. And when God is speaking to Cain, God tells Cain that sin has a desire for you, but you must rule over it. Now, If we use that same meaning from Genesis 4 and Genesis 3, here's the meaning that we come up with. And I want to read the exact text to you this morning. It says this. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrows and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And listen to this. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. In chapter 4... Sin desired to have Cain, desired to rule over him. And yet God told him, you need to rule over your sin. Here in Genesis chapter 3, I'll tell you what I think this means. A woman's rebellious heart, just like a man's, is rebellious against authority, is rebellious against somebody being head over them. And so it's saying here, Your desire will be to rule over your husband, to trumpet over his headship over you. But he shall rule over you. This morning, a third reason why the scriptures give that a husband is because of the curse. That a woman's desire would be to rebel and to rule over whom God had put in that position of the head of the home that it would be her natural desire to rule over him, but she was to make that subservient. Now this morning, these conversations make people uncomfortable, don't they? Some of you are probably already sitting there and saying, ooh, he's using words I don't like, right? But if we step into the context of its meaning, and if we step into the beautiful picture that marriage designed, and if you'll bear with me for a few moments, I think we'll see something that women would not rebel against, but rather embrace. And when we do that, there is a beautiful thing that begins to happen. And I hope you'll stick with me this morning to see that. See, in Proverbs, you see, all this description naturally brings to mind this assertion or this exaggeration that Satan can plant seeds in our hearts to think, and that is women are incapable Maybe some of you heard me say that this morning. I didn't say that. Maybe that's just what Satan wants you to hear. That you're not intelligent enough. That you lack some primary quality that men have, and yet common sense should tell us that's not the case. Many women are much more exceptional when it comes to many aspects of life, and some even more aspects of life than their husband. And that naturally speaking, they would probably be a better leader in the home than what their husbands would be. And yet God designed it differently. So this morning, we don't assert today that by any stretch of the the imagination, 
women are by any means less capable, less able, less intelligent, or less valued by God than men are. As a matter of fact, what we find in Proverbs 31 is this incredible picture of a Christian woman. And you tell me this morning, I'm going to read for you the descriptions, at least that I got out, from Proverbs chapter 31. And I didn't include all of them for the sake of time, but I wanted to summarize them in today's language, what God is saying a Christian woman or a woman that is a virtuous woman has. He describes her first in chapter, in chapter 31, verse 10 of Proverbs by saying she's a virtuous woman. You know that woman, that word virtuous in verse 10 means the word strength. That's what that word means in the original Hebrew. So he's saying this, who can find a woman of strength? Her price is far above rubies. Strength like what? I think we all know it's not talking about physical strength here. It's talking about strength of character. Now I'll pause for a moment and say this. There are less and less in our day young ladies of strong character. Oh, there's plenty of ladies like the Bible describes in the book of Proverbs. And I made a list of that too. In the book of Proverbs, I went through the first seven chapters this week. And I went through and listed all the qualities that many women that God said for young men to avoid have. Listen to this. Proverbs 6.24 and 2.17. Lewd women. Homebreakers in Proverbs chapter 7. Ones that focus and only have outer beauty and Proverbs 6.25. Women who do primarily their work with their lips. Proverbs 2.19.25.24. A woman whose focus is outside the home and not in her home. Proverbs 2.17. A woman who lives by lust and the desires of her heart. Proverbs 7.10. A woman who is loose at night. Proverbs 7, 19, and verse 18. And that woman is also, can be, a religious woman who entices young men with her religiosity, but she has no virtue or strength of character within. Listen, today, young ladies, if you've not been married today, I'll tell you this, and you want a godly husband. I think that's a natural desire that all young people have is that they look at the opposite sex and they're saying, I want somebody that I could spend the rest of my life with and be happy and satisfied. And I hope this morning you'll know this. You need to look for the right kind of man. But before you start looking for the right kind of man, you need to prepare your heart that you're the type of young lady, that you become the type of woman that God is laying out in his word. That type of woman attracts the right kind of man. And a woman described in Proverbs attracts the wrong kind of men. And very often, young ladies with the desire for a, a man's attention will go out and will prepare their lives in all the wrong ways and they get to the age where they're able to marry and they attract all the wrong men and then they get in a relationship with some wrong man and they marry them and then for the rest of their lives they're living in regret of the decision that they made and that is in large part because they did not first go to God and ask him to prepare their hearts. They didn't strive to be a woman of strong character like Proverbs 31.10 outlines. Make that to the desire of your heart. Had a friend here recently, waited till she was 33 years old to find a spouse. Had another female friend recently that had not kissed a boy until she was 32 years old, standing at the altar with her husband. And do you know why she said that she didn't? Because she was waiting for the man that God sent to her. Not many young ladies out there like that, is there? Not many young men of the same type of character, is there, like we described last week? Save yourself to be like that. She's a woman of strength, Proverbs 31.10 says. Listen to what else it says. In verse 11, it says she's trustworthy. The heart of her husband doth 
safely trust in her. Verse 12 of Proverbs 31. She's consistent. She's consistent. You know, one of the things, and I think I've mentioned this already before, but one of the difficult things about being a grown-up is not the requirements that we have to meet, but it's the fact that we have to meet those requirements and responsibilities consistently. There are many people who can reach heights of responsibility periodically. There are many Christians that can attain God's calling for their life periodically. But what God calls us to do is be consistent in what he has called us to do. In verse 13, it says this, that a a virtuous woman is one who strives to carry out the calling of God in her life consistently. And that because of her consistency, it is rewarding to her husband bountifully. Continues and says this, this woman goes out and she buys a field. And she makes a profit. That sounds like a woman who is industrious and business savvy. It continues. It says that she's compassionate both to her maidens and to the poor and to the needy. You know, at times there is a sense to which the difference between how men and women created, and I'm speaking in generalities here, but that oftentimes men can lack compassion. And this is saying that the, the, the wife, the virtuous woman, sees the need of people around her. And she sees the helping those that are in need. Uses the word in verse 27 that she looketh well to her household. That word looking well is used all throughout scripture to identify spies that would go spy things out. I've noticed with my wife and I, she tends very often to be much more perceptive than I am about people's emotions, about people's thoughts, about people's feelings, about specific things that have gone on. And this is saying that a virtuous woman is one who strives to be perceptive to the needs of people around her, that she is spying that out. Tells us that she's intelligent, that she is a willing Worker without resentment. Tells us that she's kind, that she condescends to people of low estate in verse 20, that she's skilled and thoughtful and humble, that she's a planner, and that she condescends to people of low estate. Now, listen, this is talking about a virtuous woman this morning. Now, I know many women like this that have these qualities in differing degrees. Many of you ladies have these qualities with differing degrees. And the, the fundamental question that you have to ask is this. Are you going to use these God given qualities or rather this, whom for whom are you going to use these God given qualities? See what the women's feminist movement today has tried to do is divide husbands and wives. They've tried to make all men to be out this oppressive, that we have some patriarchy, that we're trying to oppress women and make them subservient to the will of men. But the Bible tells us a different story and what it desires and what it calls a wife, a virtuous woman to do, to be a picture of the Lord's church. And in so doing, she is serving her home that her desire is that all of these qualities would be directed primarily to the people of her home. It's not whether a woman is strong or smart enough or good enough. It's who is she going to use all of those wonderful qualities to serve. The world will tell you, go out and serve self. Because at the core of every question that they want you to answer is all about you. It's liberating you so that you feel good and you feel fulfilled. And yet that's a very dangerous place because any time we answer a biblical question with how this will benefit us for men or for women, it becomes a dangerous thing because what the Bible teaches us is that the root of all sin is selfishness. And when I am set on my own welfare and on my own fulfillment, 
It becomes a dangerous thing. If you remember when we talked to husbands last week, we went through Ephesians 5, and what we saw was that a a godly husband was one who didn't focus on self. He was never thinking of self. Rather, he was thinking to the welfare of his wife and his children and all the people around him to the point that he would give his life for the good of his family and his wife. Wives, you're called to the same thing. You're called to to employ your gifts and who you are for the good of your husband and your children. You know, there are many women who when they give themselves over to that and they're willing to be this portrait and picture of the church because what I read in Proverbs 31 is also quite an amazing picture of the Lord's church. Of One who, if a church would be as this woman was, smart and intelligent, planning, uh, helping the needy, compassionate, all of those qualities that God calls a virtuous woman to, if the Lord's church would be that way and they would be subject to the management of what God wants. One of the, the distinctives that God's people have, that missionary Baptist people have, is that we insist that we ought to do everything by God's direction. You go out in the world today and they have deacon committees that plan everything or they have a pastor who rules and basically says, these are the programs that we're going to do and these are the people that we're going to help and here's how we're going to spend our money and here are the activities that we're supposed to be belong or be a part of. But what is a distinctive of God's people is that we believe God speaks to us and that he gives us guidance to go out to, spe- to specific people whom he has called us to, to help and to love and to show compassion to. And by doing those things, we're honoring and worshiping God and furthering the influence and showing the picture of the gospel that he desires. This morning in 1 Timothy chapter 3, when it begins to give the description of an elder in the church, it says one that ruleth his home well. That word ruleth means manages his home well. Husbands, we're called to look in our homes and look at all the gifts and talents and personalities in our homes. And if you're like my home, I have a great variety of personalities, a great variety of gifts, even though they're just at a young age. And if I'm going to do, do my house well and honor God in my house, I need to first take inventory of all of the gifts in my home, including my own, and then employ them in a place that will magnify and edify each member of my house and glorify God. Husbands today, do you know what your kids' strengths and weaknesses are? Have you told them? Do you know what your wife's strengths and weaknesses are? Have you told her? Have you used the water of the word to cleanse and sanctify and build up your home? God calls us to do that. And in turn, wives, your desire, just like your husband's, ought to be, what can I do to love my spouse first and serve my home? Here, the scripture tells us that there will be times with two people in a home that there will be disagreement between a husband and his wife. Listen, it's, as a husband, it's a big job to be the one that's responsible for managing your home. And with that big job comes responsibility to which we'll give account to God for. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 told wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. As a form of worship to God... Submit to your husband's management. It's a hard thing to hear today. It's something that's missing in today's world. It's really twofold. Number one, husbands that care about their homes enough that they're willing to manage it with care and attention. And secondly, a wife who's willing to respect her husband and worship the Lord through her service to her home and submission to her husband. It's not a popular message today. I've spoken with many 
young ladies or even older ladies that don't like it to the extent. And I'm always just curious, then how do you explain this scripture? See, what God sees, rather, in this picture is this opportunity for a husband and a wife to become one flesh. For this husband to so sacrificially love his wife that he shows forth the picture of Jesus Christ giving himself entirely for his home. Because we need to back up in a minute and say, why does God do this? And I think it's primarily because when two people come together devoted to carrying out God's calling, there isn't this revulsion towards this picture. Rather, there is an embracing of it. I love the fact that my wife loves God enough that she is willing to allow me to make decisions for the welfare of our home. And I love her enough to know that she has a great deal of wisdom and intelligence and insight and perception and compassion. And she is gifted by God with all of these extraordinary things that it would be against uh, any sort of wisdom or God's calling for me to rule with some iron fist and think that I can plop my feet up and that it's her job to do the work. Rather what it is, I feel this humble indebtedness to go before God and say, God, I've been blessed with this home, with this beautiful wife and three children and to manage this and to try to do it in a way that would glorify you and honor you utmost. God, give Kathleen the insight. God, give me the insight to guide this home in the direction that you would have us to go. And when two people are equally committed to submitting to God and a husband is willing to take the mantle of leadership and try to the best of his ability to rule and to manage his home and his wife is willing to, to give all of her gifts for the welfare of the home under the management and rule of her husband. It is a beautiful picture that the world is desperately lacking today. And so what you have instead is this. Two selfishly minded people with their own ambition looking out for number one. And when it's convenient, when it's practical, I'll look out for you and our children and we'll have this unspoken agreement about who does what versus the intentional choice to obey God and his word and live out this picture of Christ and his church. I believe a woman will never be more satisfied than when she finds a godly husband that desires to live and be a servant leader in her home that seeks after God with all of his heart. You know, there are some times where men don't do that because that's the next question that arises, right? Okay, Brother Brad, you're, you're putting up this perfect picture of a husband. What if that doesn't happen? What do I do then? Aren't you thankful that God's scriptures are sufficient to give us an answer to that? First Peter chapter 3 tells us that a wife ought to continue to humbly serve the Lord and serve her family and her husband in meekness so that her husband could be won over by her actions. You know, I, I remember there was someone who I knew who was in a bad marriage. And for years and years, this it wasn't that this man was violent. It's that he was not living up to God's calling for him in a noticeable way. He was lacking as a father, not just by Christian standards, by any standards. And this wife remained devoted to him, continued to pray for him, continued to love him, continued to encourage him. No doubt made mistakes along the way, but continued to be a light and an example through her actions and her words. And I would still remember when finally, after 15 or 20 years of marriage, when he came back and credited the love of his wife for what convicted him in bringing him back to living for the Lord. Listen, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter had a wife. And he said... Wives, if your husband is unwilling to be that leader in the home, 
you pray for them and you love them and you carry out as unto the Lord. Listen, if that doesn't happen, if she goes her whole life and her husband's unwilling to yield to what God has called him to, it is still her proper worship in the Lord to serve as God commanded and made her responsible for. Because in all things that we do, all of our actions, regardless of who we're seeking to benefit in those, they're all meant to go to the praise of God. When I preach the gospel, I hope you're benefited from it. I hope you're helped. I hope you learn from it. But foremost, I'm called to worship God in it. And every action that you do as a husband and a wife, at the root of it, ought to be this desire to serve God. I would say today, there is much missing in Christian marriages because very often people have adopted the values of our culture that are pragmatic rather than the values that God lays out in his word. Husbands, love your wives enough to be a godly man, a godly man, Be a leader in your home. Don't shy away. Don't abdicate to your wife all the things that need to be done in the home. Wives, for some men, it is hard to lead. It's unnatural to make decisions. It's difficult to do all the work that is, that is entailed often in making a good decision. Help him. Love him. Help cultivate in your husband by your attitude, by the willingness to edify him with your words and respect him. Help him to develop into that. That can be very difficult. I can testify as one who didn't grow up with the sterling example of a husband and a wife in my home. And very much in our early marriage and even to this day, I feel as though I'm wobbling and trying to figure this thing out because I've never observed it in a home. And it has taken a great deal of patience in a godly woman who allowed me to make untold mistakes. All the time knowing I really want to do it right. I want to lead my home. Husbands, young men who are yet to be married, start praying now that God would develop you into the man and the husband and father you need to be. Now, you know, we have this thing that we try to stay childlike and allow our children to be as childlike as possible to the point now where 30 and 35 and 40-year-old men spend the majority of their time playing video games instead of learning how to be a man. Recently, we had some friends that grew up down, I believe here in Kentucky, who were married whenever he was 17 and she was 14. Not a lot I'm going to say about that other than to say this. What impresses me the most is that they were in any way prepared to be husband and wife. I didn't say they were prepared, but I'm just saying that they thought themselves prepared enough that they can embark on that 62 or 64-year-old journey that they took as husband and wife. Here's my point. They grew up. Young men, he said by the time he was 18, he bought his own farm and was operating his own farm with his wife. By the time she was 17, she had two children. Part of the reason why that's unthinkable today, and I'm not saying I advocate it, all I'm saying is this. They desired to grow to be grown men and grown women. Young men and young women, don't stay adolescent forever. Don't. Don't try to be young and focus on self and fun. Grow to be men. Grow to be godly, virtuous women. Seek after those whom are, you, you have identified as people who are walking a path that you say, that's a grown man, that's a godly man that is worth me following. Parents of young children, let us not raise boys, let us raise men. 
Let us see the young ones in our, in our church and not think that they cannot be entrusted with responsibility, but yet need all the rights and privileges to make their self-esteem feel better. There is a sense to which we don't need to adopt the values of our culture. One of those ways is not only in the roles of husbands and wife, but it starts by the training of young men and young women. Give them responsibility that if they mess up, it hurts everybody. And that's what we do when they're 16, right? We hand them a license and a car and we give them permission. Rather, we give them the opportunity, rather, if they make a mistake, to kill a lot of people. And what we're saying is this. We're going to teach you. We're going to help you. We're going to give you guidance. And then we're going to give you a real privilege. But with that privilege comes a great deal of responsibility. And if you abuse it, it can harm a whole lot of people. Husbands, that's how you ought to treat your children. Right? Is ones who, as you're progressing, them growing, they're not always responsible for doing the same mundane, small, childlike things, but you're monitoring them with your wife's help and her perception and her, 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 her ability to perhaps see more in the home than what you're able to, that you would give to your children progressively more responsibility to the point where, at times, they are learning how to be you. Where you literally say, I've got to make this decision, but for this particular occasion, you're responsible for making this decision for our home. I can't imagine, many of you experience this, and I'm going to close, how wonderful it must be for a husband and a wife who have invested in their child for two decades or more to then see their child stand up on their own two feet and a young man lead the way he's supposed to and a young woman embody those godly virtues. One of the reasons why Sister Grace Keene passing away has been so hard on my heart is because she's one of the few young ladies that I've ever seen who sought to embody Proverbs 31. I don't know how to give a young lady a better compliment than that. I mean, she really strove to it. And as her dad said, she finished her race and she ran it well. This morning, God has called you to that. I pray today, God would use his word. The strength of a church rests upon the strength of the marriages in that church. The strength of those marriages rests upon a man's willingness to be a leader of his home and a wife's willingness to help him do that with all that she has. That their focus would be raising this beautiful thing God gifted with called a family. And that that family would be this extraordinary picture of an otherworldly relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. Isn't it a wonderful thing that you and the person you love most in this world have an opportunity to show the gospel, not just share it? We focus a lot about sharing the gospel verbally. You and your spouse have an opportunity to show it through the way that you love and the way that your home functions. You can show the picture of Christ in his church. As Brother Steve said last week, if you have things you want to talk about regarding a husband, he said, go talk to Brother Brad. And I say, if you have things you'd like to talk about with this, go talk to Brother Steve. Right. Uh, not really. Uh, I welcome it this morning because I believe it's something that's sorely lacking. I hope you know this morning, ladies, heard this story one time about Mongolians, back when Mongolian, Mongolia controlled the greatest part of the world. And it said that at first what they would do when they would go into a community is they would kill all the young men from 10 years and older, all the men 10 years and older. And then after a generation, they realized that was a mistake. 
Because what they realized was this. The strength of a culture is oftentimes found in the seat of the home and the person who is regulating that more than anyone is the wife. And so what they came to learn was this. They made a mistake in killing all the men because what would happen is this. Those women would raise their, fa- their, their children in such a way to honor their fallen husbands that after a generation, it was hardly noticeable that anything had occurred at all. I hope this morning nobody misunderstands what I'm saying. Alexis de Tocqueville came here in 1830, and you know what he said was the strength of the American culture? The value that we place upon the role of our women. By no means this morning am I meaning to diminish the wife's value. Rather, I'm meaning to exalt it in its proper place. I hope that's what you got this morning. That's our message today. Pray God would place it in your heart as, as it was intended.